Can you hear that? I can hear it. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Inside the Mediation Room with Karen and Michael Orrick. We've got a live studio audience. And oh my goodness, Karen, I'm so stoked for today. Chip Rose. Chip Rose is here. Oh my. Chip Rose. Whoa. Woo! Whoa. Chip Rose by day, Superman inside the mediation room. He has been called the Muhammad Ali of mediation. And yet again, in 2022, he made the Forbes list for top five mediation gurus to emulate. Chip Rose is with us. Oh my goodness. We are so grateful to have you, Chip. Chip, um, Chip you are truly one of the first practicing divorce mediators in the world. Uh, in 1981, Chip founded the Mediation Center in Santa Cruz. He is a APFM, uh, former APFM president and lifetime award honoree. He is such a beloved trainer. He has trained everywhere. He's written uh, numerous publications. Uh, he's the author of the book, Collaborative Family Law Practice. He's contributed to just about every book here uh, in the background. Just a hero of ours. Chip, welcome to Inside the Mediation Room. Happy to be here. First, A little humbled with the introduction, which am I, <laughs> is the part that I always want to get past the quickest. <clears throat> uh, Superman himself. That's how we see you, Chip. Um, that's yeah. how the field sees you. Um, most importantly, uh, before we get into a slew of, of, of questions, um, and we cannot wait to hear your thoughts, the most important question begins with Karen. Karen, where do we begin with Chip? Oh, goodness, Chip. Think back to childhood. What was your favorite childhood cereal of all time. And we must know this before you can move on. Yes, yes, yes. Hmm. Shredded wheat. Oh it my goodness. Come, it used to come in vertical boxes. There were three biscuits on three rows. You would crumble the biscuit and then you could take out the cardboard liner and there were all of these great things on, you know, how to start a fire in the forest without matches and how to do, uh, how to trap an animal and um, sort of Boy Scout type stuff. And I, I just love getting those and learn to like shredded wheat, which uh, by the way, I'm still eating to this day. I enjoy it so much. <laughs> wow. In a world of instant gratification, I'm not sure we could go through all of those steps now. We just want to pour our cereal into a bowl. Right. But it sounds fun. I mean, I, I, I wonder, I mean, shredded wheat versus, I remember Don Saposnik, his answer was oatmeal. I mean, we expect Lucky Charms, maybe a cinnamon toast crunch. Wasn't it? Oh, shredded wheat. Maybe around. shredded wheat. Yeah, maybe shredded wheat was the way to go. Maybe that explains a lot, Chip. It's it's very nutritious and delicious. Just put some fresh blueberries on it. And as a kid, I, I'll admit I put sugar on it. I don't do that anymore. But um, it's 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 so nourishing. And it takes a little bit of time to prepare it and eat it, which um, makes that enjoyable as well, as opposed to something you might just rush through if you're in a hurry. Wow. Nourishing and mindful. We all need a little bit more of that every morning. Okay. All right. It's time, Michael, for Thank shredded you. meat in the house. I mean, good. Lucia, <laughs> Lucia Cantor St. Amour is, is, in, is in the studio audience, and, and she's just come out with a, a, an amazing new book. Um, Going to have to get her on the show. I hope you, you heard, Lucia, um, shredded wheat. Mm -hmm. um, all right. 
Let's thank you, Chip, for that. Thank you. Uh, we're going to get into this. We're going to get into this. And, and we've heard that you complied with our request. Chip, we heard that you complied and that you've taken a test that we've asked you to take. It's the high five strengths test. Uh, we heard that you took the test. I did. And uh, I'm not sure if I passed, but I took it. OK. I think everyone passes. So I think you're good there, Chip. You can't not pass. Oh, OK. It's a, it's, a, it's a win every time. But you've taken this test, and it's given you some results. It's given you five of what they believe, the high five people believe, are your top strengths. And we want to understand what, what the results are and, and kind of start with uh, strength number one, your number one strength. And we want to understand uh, what that is and, and how you think that strength has been instrumental in you being such an effective mediator. How, how have you used that strength? First of all, let's get to the strength. What does, what is your top strength? Number one. Empathizer. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay. Can you read that for us, Chip? Yeah. Empathizers are great at understanding how people feel and use this sensibility to do good for others. They become frustrated when asked to disregard feelings and focus solely on logic instead. Was this the first time you knew you had the strength or do you think you might have had an inkling or two in the last? No, I, I, I mean, I've, I've, I've been aware of, um, in fact, I've used the term um, empathic behavior um, throughout my mediation um, experience, uh, career, really. Um, my mother, I think, was a great empathizer. And what's interesting about this, though, is that it says uh, that they, meaning people of this category, become frustrated when asked to disregard feelings and focus solely on logic instead. So my mother gave me the empathic characteristics and, and uh, genes, and my father gave me logic. And so part of my logic side uh, has to struggle a little bit with the empathic side to decide which one is going to be uh, more appropriate in responding to the circumstances. But that's sort of the yin and the yang of, of those characteristics. Interesting, interesting. And how do you see that play out in mediation? You said your mother had the empathic side and your father brought you the logical side. So how did you find yourself using both of those in mediation? Well, the empathic side was easy because it would help me uh, sort of use that to connect with clients um, um, and, and connect with clients on a primary emotional level. Um, the logic side is extremely helpful in trying to find a path through complicated situations. However, where the logic side uh, comes up against the empathic side, um, and I can sort of say this as a, as a bit of a generalization, but more often than not, I have found myself pushing a logical perspective on, um, and I would say the overwhelming number of times would be a woman who needed an empathic response from me, not a logical response. And early on, I wasn't very, I didn't get that. Fortunately, over time, I, I learned and uh, was able to read the signals um, more quickly and change my response, uh, focusing more on um, empathic understandings than simply the logic of, you know, here's a pathway through the forest here, uh, which people aren't always ready to hear. That's something you really learn in mediation. It's, it's not about just seeing a potential solution <clears throat> and telling them and then they'll embrace it. It's getting to know them well enough to know what do they need to do to be able to ultimately embrace that since they're ultimately wanting to get to solutions, but not always ready to. Do you find that that's, that was, that's actually true uh, inside the mediation room, Chip, on kind of a moment to moment basis that as you're moving through conversation with clients, that actually oftentimes you start even a statement with some empathizing 
before you get to the logic or you start a monologue, you, you monologue and, and, and show that genuine empathy and then move into the logic. Um, just as you go, um, have you found that to be very helpful, especially with certain clients? Well, I would say, um, you know, having the flexibility and the um, perception to know how to strike a balance between empathic information or feelings and logic information or answers. And <clears throat> needless to say, you may have a couple that they each want one of those, but not the other at the moment. And so the uh, challenge for a mediator is figuring out how to strike that balance and, um, um, and be as effective as you can be in getting them both engaged in a conversation. I've had circumstances where one party was being having an incredibly intense emotional moment and the other person sometimes um, evidenced just annoyance that that was what was going on. And so all of the attention, um, all of my attention was given to trying to uh, respond empathically to the person who was in an emotional state uh, and for the moment not worrying about the other. I mean, depending on the level of you know zero to 10 intensity, um, and in other cases, you could balance that by doing a little bit of both. Interesting. So in that situation, and we've all been there, where one person needs that compassion from the mediator and the other um, may be actually alienated by, um, by that showing of empathy, you break toward showing the empathy and that may be because it's your top strength. It's what you lead with. Um, were you surprised by your result that your number one strength is, is empathy? I'm sorry, so I, your volume is a little low. At, oh, are, were you surprised by the result, Chip? Um, not, not completely, not completely. I mean, you know, um, 42 years into this work, um, is, is both um, educational and humbling <laughs> in terms of what you learn about yourself uh, with the um, variety of different people that you deal with. And then, and then some of the patterns that you, you deal with in terms of types of personalities that repeat in different clients that you have which allows you the ability to then try to develop appropriate responses uh, to be able to deal with those. But um, no, it didn't, it, it didn't actually surprise me. I mean, I had no idea what, what this test was going to show or what the labels would be, but um, yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't terribly surprised by that. And Chip, just out of curiosity, what were your other four top strengths? There's five strengths on the test. And your first one was yes, exactly. Yes, the second one was uh, peacekeeper. Wow. The third one was strategist. The fourth was problem solver, and the fifth was coach. Oh my goodness! I I'm not entirely sure I've ever met somebody who had every strength <laughs> fit so well. You in, know, you, you you I tell you, a mediator, um, Chip, you really should go into mediation. I, I was thinking about it as an alternate career because uh, might work out. You know, this, con this concert violinist is just not uh, paying out. No, I grew up in a um, uh, middle class, um, I'm going to say um, regularly conflicted family. I don't want to say high conflict uh, because it doesn't approach the kind of stuff that Bill Eddy uh, has been so effective in teaching us. But my parents, there was tension practically every night, but there was never, um, arguments didn't break out much and there was no physicality to it because among other things, my father would just retreat uh, to his, um, his bedroom home. He lived, they had separate bedrooms from the time I was in fifth grade. And I was the, I was the third child, two older sisters, firstborn boy. I was really protected. Um, you know, my parents, ne it never got to a point where um, any, there, was, there was never any violence. It was just tension and, and personality conflict between the two of them. They, they, 
evidence such different personalities. And so, and I, and I had two older sisters above me to kind of buffer it. So um, I found when I um, first turned away from doing uh, traditional divorce work as a lawyer, which uh, I found, I mean, I, I had a case when I was working in a personal injury law firm and they had a, a divorce case, they gave it to me. I just found that I was very comfortable working directly with the people. And over time, as I got a few more cases, um, I found it far more interesting than suing insurance companies and um, you know negotiating settlements, all of which felt like it was there was a kind of an artificiality to it and a disconnect. Um, and when I dealt with people going through divorce, there was a real connection. Um, and I realized that I was um, pretty comfortable in conflict, wow. you know. Uh, and so when I started mediating, and I now had both of them in the room, I'd never done, I'd never experienced that. I mean, when I did my very first one, they were my very first one. And this is 1980, late 1980. And um, uh, the, only, uh, the only awareness I had of it was the idea that I had been given my, by my, uh, my brother-in-law in San Diego, who uh, was going on the Superior Court bench. And he said, uh, have you heard about mediation? And I said, I know the word, but I don't know the context. And he said, his definition was, one lawyer sits down with both clients and helps them settle a case. Well, in, in 1980, that made great sense to me, and it was practically revolutionary, you know, like, well, can we do that? Will the state bar yank our license? And so immediately, uh, I thought, well, I, I'm hearing that this is starting to happen, so I guess we can do it. And uh, no sooner did I invite the first clients to come in than I just, um, I felt at home in that environment. I felt like, this is good. I've got both parties here. We're talking. We're using we're using real language and talking about real concerns and real feelings, none of which was going on in the kind of uh, personal injury, uh, typical civil litigation, yeah. um, where everything seemed to be a slightly artificial. I, I remember, Chip. Oh, go ahead, Karen. What a powerful, powerful story. I mean, you said that you, you realized you felt comfortable in conflict. Mm -hmm. And when you had your first set of clients, you felt at home. Well, that's, yeah. that's for sure coming from your gut, you really knowing you're in the right place. And so you must have, Chip, had some fundamental beliefs about resolving conflict. Uh, well, I mean, going back to the very beginning, um, I guess in um, uh, an intrinsic belief that, that was never articulated in my brain was that um, if people were shown a path, they would prefer to find a way to settle that was beneficial to them than beat their head against the wall because of their anger or emotion or upset. Now, that was, that was an unarticulated, just kind of intrinsic, this seemed, the, 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 this seemed to work and it seemed to be moving in the right direction. If I if I articulated that now uh, in a in a a more experienced uh, core belief, it would be that the rationality of self interest can be the uh, life ring that most all clients can grasp. Not all, there are those that can't. But um, so what? So I I when I'm doing my initial consultation with clients, I'll say. Um, this is a process in which your self-interest is perfectly appropriate. And I, and I want you to know that coming in. There is nothing wrong with, with saying, well, what's in it for me? And I said, and even if I told you there was something wrong, you're going to feel that way anyway. So it doesn't, I may as well just acknowledge it. However, in this process, the other side of the coin of self-interest is mutuality. And you will not maximize your benefit, a term I got from Jim Balamid. There's a great story about that. Um, you will not maximize your self-interest without the other person with whom you're negotiating doing the same. Everything else is less than full. Yeah. Any outcome is less than full. And a litigated outcome is, is barely a fraction of, of what you can achieve. And that's a challenge because self-interest wants you to think just about yourself. The mutuality side says, Wow, I have to think about the other person. And uh, so one of the things as a mediator, 
that I think is such an important role that we play is uh, when we're helping the clients negotiate. And, and I've always chosen to do that in a um, help them prepare their proposals in a caucus format. There's a lot to talk about about that. And in that caucus format, I'm helping them do something they often can't do, which is looking for the looking for the marble that would be the trading to create a mutual interest, oftentimes in things that are completely unrelated. Um, I had a um, about a year ago or so, I was uh, dealing with a case of two um, uh, people who uh, the wife was just going back into employment after years of child raising and the husband worked for one of the high tech companies in Silicon Valley. And they had been separated for a year uh, before we actually started the negotiation. And she said, if you'd agree to let me participate in your 401k up to this last December, a year after they separated, which under California law would, would have stopped the community interest a year earlier, I'll agree to shorten spousal support to this period of time instead of leaving it open. That, that gave each of them something they were looking for that the law doesn't have the capacity to do that. And so, you know, the ability to help them uh, explore things and be mindful of, well, what are the interests that I've been hearing sitting here as a mediator listening to each of you and I'm doing something that you, neither of you are doing is I'm listening to the other person and I'm looking for clues of how to bargain with them. And, and so then helping clients find those things and try matching them up to see if they'll work, um, I think is uh, something they really need because uh, oftentimes they're just um, so close to the forest, they can't see the trees. Or they're so close to the trees, they can't see the forest. I forget which way that goes. So, so there's, there's trees in a forest somewhere. Uh, so Chip, inherent in what you're saying, kind of your, your initial belief and then how that's evolved, is it, is it a stretch to, to uh, reframe and summarize this as you do believe that if people understand that their self-interest is part of the equation, that truly everybody, or maybe just about everybody, wants to settle. Everybody wants to settle. Um, is it a healthy belief for a mediator to go into mediation believing, you know, they, their behavior may not show it, um, their attitudes may not show it, their words may not reflect it, but at people's core, people want to reach agreements. True? <laughs> not true in your experience. I think I think that uh, no I, I I mean by and large uh, yes absolutely they do but I think their first thought coming in is self interest and so part of what I try to do is validate for them that's a very important role in this and and you need to focus on self interest but guess what in a um, maximized negotiation it comes at the cost of being coming aware of how you can help the other person achieve his or her uh, self interest. And that trading of those, what I call marbles, when I'm dealing with them, try and just normalize it, um, th that those two things are, are, you can't separate them. You know, so you can't just talk about self-interest or what I want without them recognizing that in reality, in a pol you know, polarized negotiation where they're each around self-interest around each of their ends, it's mutuality that will get them to the common middle ground. And, and that for most people is just not something they were thinking about. So that to me is a real um, you know, 90 degree turn from how they come into the process to how they get to the finish. I, I really wonder, Karen, if that is something that mediators can look to in terms of their marketing. I wonder if we're too focused on the idea of compromise, the mutuality piece. Right, that's really what we're putting out there. Is yeah, that and the word compromise for most people means I don't get what I want. Right, you know, right. so you, it, I've always felt that you have to meet them where they come into the room, wow. and they come into the room, you know, angry or or upset or dying to get out of it or what all the various emotions that people bring into the room. But first and foremost, uh, you know, I. <laughs> 
I guess the best way to describe it is this. Um, uh, I've been thinking about, but I haven't yet uh, written a book called uh, The Newtonian Laws of Relationships. And it started with this idea that um, uh, we're all eggs floating in space, if you will. And you really, when you look up at the sky and you hear and think about the vastness of space, we literally are. Gravity is what pulls us together. And, but we're each our own individual shell. We have our own individual thoughts, our own individual feelings and emotions. And no matter how much we get together in a relationship uh, and fool ourselves that we're now a unit, we're a couple, it's just two individual units that have enough common connections that they choose to stay together because of the gravity of their relationship with each other. But when that, when that breaks and they're in the process of now separating and ending their relationship uh, as a couple, um, they're just focused on what's inside their own eggshell. They come that way, generally speaking. Um, and no, I mean, there's variations on that. There's, there's the, uh, the spouse who just, you know, feels like they need to give the other person whatever they want, because that's been the pattern in the relationship and there's psychological and emotional imbalances that need to be addressed and those kinds of things. But on a, on a sort of a thousand foot view scale, um, they're far more aware at that point of the way they were when they first met, which is that, you know, they didn't have any feelings about either one of each other. And that emotional gravity that pulls them together, um, when that goes, as unfortunately for most of our clients uh, that goes, then the question is, okay, what, what do we replace that with now in the most critical negotiation of their lives? And, and I think that recognizing that they're starting with self-interest, but telling them that the key to that is mutuality and while they have, they're very skilled at um, focusing on their self-interest, they're not very skilled at looking at the mutuality that is necessary in order for them to uh, come to a maximized mutually beneficial agreement. Gosh, it reminds me, not to relate it to, to parenting, but you know, we have a four and five-year-old, so I relate everything to parenting. There's this term I've read in, in several books called connect and redirect. Mm -hmm. If your child is having an issue and um, maybe scratching or biting, you want to get down and connect with them first. Instead of correcting the behavior, you want to connect and say, I understand you're frustrated. And mm -hmm. once you've connected and given them a hug, gotten to their level, then you can redirect them and that's when they can be redirected. So it sounds like what you're doing is you're meeting them where they're at with empathy and you're saying, I hear you, this is normal. You have self-interest, we all do, of course you do. And then you're saying, and so we know that now it's on the table, let's label it, let's allow it to be, but there's a better way. And that's, that's for us to find an agreement that works for both of you. And that's where you bring in that logic. Yeah, I think that, absolutely, Karen. I think that, um, I think that so many uh, of us um, think in terms of the, the kind of characteristics you describe if you were um, saying, what does this process consist of? And don't necessarily personalize it. So, um, so this, the second uh, belief that I would add to that first one, the first one was the rationality of self-interest. The second one is that caring for clients can be more effective than the analytical help that you give them. Oh, tell us more. Well, it, um, it took a while and, you know, I mean, a number of experiences because it was all brand new to me as I was doing this. And quite frankly, I was just kind of looking for a settlement compromise model. You know, how do you, how do you come up with an answer that doesn't involve going to court? But as time went by, I found that, um, that clients aren't always ready for uh, an the analytical help that we should have the capacity to give them. And sometimes what they need most is just uh, being heard. We talk about that an awful lot, right? Uh, and, and being understood. And, and that's where I think the um, empathic part of our roles as mediators uh, can, can be so critical. Um, 
I've always tried, uh, quite frankly, because it was just natural to me, but when I'm talking to clients in an initial consultation, um, to talk to them as though I've been their friends for years, not yeah. as I'm just meeting them and I'm just trying to introduce them to something. And um, now in my particular practice, uh, once we've gone through all of the uh, discussions about assets, liabilities, the law model, what I call the real world, and then what are things they want to uh, try to accomplish and move then into negotiation. I've always met with them individually uh, in a caucus model, and it's just been the way it's worked for me and it's always worked effectively. When I'm in that caucus model, I'm their best friend. And I tell them when I'm going to meet with the other person, I'm going to be his or her best friend. In other words, it is my job is not to come up with a settlement. My job is to help you come up with a settlement. But I want you to know that, uh, you know, I care about you. I like you. I totally understand your frustration. I totally get why X, Y, Z. But the question will be, how are you going to accomplish achieving your best interest? And I'll tell you, you won't do it unless the other person does too. So for now, we need to start moving away from those kinds of emotions and start looking at the rational side of a barter exchange. Wow. Uh, you know, if I give you one, two, three, wow. will you give me ABC? Yeah. And then exploring the differences. And it's really, it's always been one of the most exciting parts of um, the process for me of remembering, you know, and I always try to remember this when first time I'm meeting with a couple that what it's going to be like when we get to the negotiation phase, because by then, even if I'm having to give them a whole lot of guidance on how to negotiate um, strategically, not emotionally. And I talked, I talk about that all the time with them. I said, you know what, I know you feel strongly, but what do you want? And what do you think is the best way you're going to be able to get him or her to give it to you? Well, let's look at what the other person wants. And um, and then when they start actually doing that and, and you start seeing the shape of the settlement, um, it is not at all unusual for once the core pieces are kind of identified uh, for them to often sit down with each other and flesh out the details themselves. I, I, think, that same process. I, I think this is breaking news. I really think it's breaking news. I mean, Chip, you are one of the originators of this process, and yet today you are still absolute cutting edge, right? Whereas the field in so many ways approaches with a, a methodology of um, maintaining some distance, um, you know, uh, the idea of neutrality at impartiality, that you cannot show support for either side. What you're doing is going the opposite, right? When I'm training right. a mediator, uh, one of the first things that I say is, hey, start, you know, try this. Hi, my name is Michael and I'm your friend. Not to actually say that to clients, but hi, my name is Michael and I'm your friend. Hi, my name is Andrew and I'm your friend. Hi whatever your name is, start reciting that mantra to yourself. Say it out loud, say it in your head, because when you enter that mediation room, they need to feel like they are supported. You can support both mm -hmm. clients. You are there with both of them, for both of them. You can do that and be their friend without taking a side and favoring one over the other but it's that kind of connection especially by the way Colin will uh, watching as we speak in the online model it's about the connection if you walk in to any mediation room online or in person and you have that belief that's a game changer in terms of the trust that they have in you and in terms of the honesty that they're able to have with themselves and with one another. And that's going to impact their agreements. That's going to impact their life. Now, over time, um, I found myself uh, modifying my initial consultation um, so that um, I would say to clients, um, a mediator is expected to be uh, neutral. I said, I don't know anybody in this planet who's neutral. I mean, how, how as human beings, how can we be neutral? 
Uh, and just as an aside, I've had people, I've had um, my, my memory bring back a big burly California highway patrolman who was probably mentally and emotionally abusive to his wife, uh, not physically. And uh, and she just cowered uh, in, in, in the face of him. And when we got to negotiation, I needed him to know that I care about his outcome as much as I care about hers. And so that kind of dealing with the kind of person that you'd never want to be have to sit next to on a, a cross country flight, you know, uh, and, and be engaging with, you need to feel as caring about that person's outcome. And in part, it's easy because the other person's outcome depends on it. So that, that linkage, that organic nature of, um, of how their interests can find um, common ground um, allowed me to tell the clients, uh, it, first of all, to get permission. I've never gone into the caucus negotiation format. I don't do that at the beginning, but I do that at the end um, without both of them saying, yeah, we're fine doing that. And I said, I want you to both know I'm going to be... Um, helping you to achieve your maximum outcome. But if I do that for each of you, you have a greater chance that you will. And I have no, I said, I really have no interest in the substantive issues. Keep the kids, sell the kids. They're not mine. You know, uh, as, a, as a humorful way of helping them understand, I don't have an agenda except their success. And they've always given me permission to do that. I've, uh, I've, um, I've had numerous times when I would have an individual phone call with one or the other, and uh, the rules around that for my process has always been, I won't talk about anything new, but I'll go over anything we've already covered that they're having an issue with uh, in terms of helping them get to the highest level of um, mental and emotional and strategic negotiation by whatever they needed to do that. And I tell the clients that and they go, fine, that works, I'm okay with that. Wow. wow. So Chip, what I'm hearing you say, and there are a lot of, I'm, I imagine, new mediators who are going to be watching this over time. You're saying drop the professional persona. Let's not keep a distance here. Let's not keep this invisible wall between us. Let's, yeah. I'm your friend. I'm your friend too. And we're here together. And you're building trust with them. You're being Chip. You're being authentic, which we all love you, Chip. And, and with that, you're building that trust. And so what is it doing? It's, it's allowing them to relax a bit. And then they're able to more clearly articulate their needs and their wants, their interests. And that's where the negotiation comes through. So it's really like, as John Saposnik says, like an art and a science. And what yeah. you said, you realized. Totally agree with Don on that. Yeah, what you've said that you've realized over the years is that you need to bring more empathy and more um, humanness into the room. So, wow, if, if we can help beginning mediators just know that off the bat, you don't have to be anyone other than yourself, but open up yourself to, to caring and compassion and empathy, and you'll be an effective mediator when you bring in that strategy. Wow, wow, wow. That's and and if, you're, if you're anchored to the the principle belief that the agreement needs to be of the clients, then it becomes easy to say, well, what do you need by way of support to do that? And in the course of acting that way, it always felt that it allowed me to be genuine with clients, not artificial, not artificially professional, not artificially intellectual, not artificially anyway. Um, and I could um, converse with a client about um, Think, things that I might observe about their behavior that I think is, 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 is hurting them in terms of the other person's reaction. Like, I, did you notice the other person's reaction when you said that? No. What, what did they do? You know, well, that's, that's I think, being, um, in other words, I, th I guess I'm saying you can be genuine and authentic and be empathic and help mm -hmm. the clients feel like they're cared for. And there's nothing wrong that they should feel cared for. And so I've always been bothered by the idea that a mediator is neutral. I've always seen somebody in a white coat in a white room with a white floor, like there's no room for anybody's emotions, uh, you know, impartial, absolutely, you know, but you can't be balanced 
in the same using the same um, weights to balance two very different people with very different needs stuck in the very same conflict. Wow. So you know, words like balanced becomes problematic for me. The, the core belief, uh, if you're taking notes, caring can be more effective than analytical help. I know that Karen, you have you have we're, we're never going to be able to get to all these questions, but I know you have some questions, and I'm hoping. I just saw uh, Jim Malamud has entered the mediation room here. Uh, he is watching, and gosh, if 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 while you're asking this question, Jim can think of something we don't know about Chip Rose. Something we don't know about Chip Rose. Um, I, I think it'd be very interesting to pull Jim in. He's going to be thinking about that. What don't? What doesn't the world know about Chip? That would be much as I try to just block Jim out. Um, yeah, I'm he, thinking about it. Yeah, he, he, he you can't escape him. Uh, he's everywhere. Um, yeah. Yes, he is. I, I, this is why I'm in Oregon. Some, sometimes I'm in a mediation and I'm I'm very positive with clients and I think to myself, Jim is probably listening and just shaking his head at me. Too positive, Michael. Well, just as an interesting story, uh, Jim and I were doing an advanced uh, mediation training at Pepperdine and you know, we're gonna, you're gonna alternate uh, during the day, you know, it's two and a half days. And uh, we actually never, I think maybe we sent each other sort of like what we did when we trained, uh, but we didn't really coordinate it. And we were having breakfast together uh, at the lovely uh, 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 cafe restaurant right down from the Malibu Inn, which was one of the great places to be able to stay if you're teaching at Pepperdine. And um, we're talking at breakfast, having coffee, and Jim started talking about maximization. And I said, oh my God, that's exactly what I do. I've never put that word to it, but that's exactly where I'm trying to help the clients get. And um, so that concept of maximization was for me the perfect encapsulation of um, what could you as clients want than to maximize the benefit you get from the outcome of whatever limited circumstances you bring, because we all have limited circumstances, but why would you settle for anything less than maximizing the benefit of that? And it can only be done by mutuality. Wow. Jim, wow. Jim needs to come into our home and help us maximize our marital negotiations. <laughs> Whoa. Yeah, that's uh, by the way. I, yeah, I, I'm there too, and that's where that's where objectivity and professionalism goes out the window. <laughs> easy, easy. We just want Jim into our home. Whoa. Doesn't yeah, everyone? Let's just get Jim in here. Jim, you can maximize our anything. Um, yeah. All right. Um, okay, Chip. Yeah, this has been got? amazing. I, I wish we had all day long. So tell us the why. Why are you dedicated? Why do you feel dedicated after all of these years? 1980s, when you started your practice, what keeps you dedicated to divorce mediation? Divorce, yeah. high conflict, high emotions. Karen, can you imagine? Well, can you uh, inserting uh, yourself, I, Chip, time and time, year after year, you are inserting yourself into conflict. Decade after decade after decade, you're still doing it. What a great question, Karen. I'm sorry, it was such a good one. What has inspired you to do that? Um, I get, clearly I get, um, oh, there's two things really, two tracks. You know, one would be, um, I love the challenge to see if the next couple is gonna be so completely different from all the other couples I've worked with that I'll have to figure something new out in terms of a strategic response or intervention. So there's, there's, there's that little piece of it. But more than that, I think, um, I just get huge satisfaction from taking people who are stumbling around the forest, banging into the trees and helping them find a constructive outcome. Um, as an ancillary benefit of that, I always feel, uh, although it's, it's, it's slightly more distance, um, I feel good for their kids. If, if mom and dad get through this without doing any more damage to the family than has already been done by the time I see them. But mostly it's just um, helping people 
not only find a way out, but to learn. And you, you actually can do this. You're capable of doing this. In fact, you're the only ones who are capable of doing it on the highest level. And so there's the individual challenge with each client, getting them to buy into that and all the things you have to do going through the process, starting with the initial consultation, which I've always thought was really critical. Uh, and I had, when I uh, decided to do this, I decided I would uh, try to have four mediation cases a day. So I would set them up in 90 minute increments. I still only work in 90 minute increments unless they want less. And so in a work day, that allowed me uh, a uh, session in the morning, a half hour break in between a session in the afternoon, lunch, and then the same thing in the afternoon. So consultations were limited to 30 minutes. So I found that I had to develop the ability to explain this process to people in a way that would appeal to them in a kind of a haiku form, because I only had 30 minutes to do it. And um, that, that was a, a wonderful exercise in sort of focusing your mind on distilling down what is the most important things for them to hear and what do they need to hear? You know, what do they need to hear? And clients always respond in that to the truth, you know, which is the legal system isn't going to give you your best outcome. It's there, but, you know, it's not going to give you your best outcome. It doesn't even have that as a goal. It simply sets the lowest common denominator for separating couples in marriage by standards that apply on the most basic elementary level. Um, but that should never be anybody's goal if they really care about where they'll be a year from now, two years from now, five years from now. Um, so helping them, the challenge of taking people who uh, on some level want to work with you as a mediator, because especially now these days where it's been around long enough that people know what it means, but their emotional sides go, but I don't know how we'll ever do that. And, and sort of, you know, give them an, uh, a handhold to first just get them into the process. That's all. Just get them to show up to a first session. Wow. And then if they show up to a first session, what they experience in it, which involves empathic understanding, which involves some answers to things, which involves a structure, uh, which involves guidelines like um, it's critical that you both make this a safe place for each other to express yourself. Um, and, uh, so, so for me, I've always done that in, uh, metaphorical pictures. Yeah. Um, I had this wonderful old couple, this became a core aspect of, of my process. I had this wonderful couple, I say old, now they were just kids <laughs> as I look back on them, but they came in and they were probably in their late sixties, maybe early seventies even, and said, you know, well, we've been together all these years, but. Uh, we just can't seem to get along. And um, so, you know, we, we think we want to get divorced. So um, I went through this uh, explanation spontaneously at the time. I had a whiteboard and I went up to the whiteboard and I drew a long rectangle and I drew a line down the middle. And I said, well, in this process, imagine you're in contiguous backyards with a five foot fence. And each of you is saying, I'll do my thing completely openly and in front of you if you do your thing completely openly and in front of me. And I said, you know, as a divorce lawyer, all I ever needed was access to the other person. And, and in this process, you would be proposing to say, I'll do everything in front of you. And the price you pay for that is stay in your own backyard. So when you hear the other person opine an opinion, well, I think the house is worth 2X. 2X, are you out of your mind? Look at what happened down the street. They just sold their house for half X. Yeah. Let that person speak their piece. Let them do their process and just observe. And if you have a legitimate question, like, are you interested in this? Feel free to ask it, but it'd be respectful over the fence. And anyway, so I went through this conversation and I said, if you, if the person doesn't treat you respectfully and, and recognize the protocols of this arrangement, all you have to do is go inside and close the door and they don't have anybody to talk to. Um, uh, so that was that they left. Wow. Um, I, obviously I told them more, they came back in about two weeks and they said, um, you know, that thing you told us in the consultation, I said, yeah. And they said, could you go over that again? Because we think if we can embrace that, that we can stay together. Now, it wasn't my goal to have that happen. It was just my goal to say, you know, here's a path forward. Um, 
but I, that that had such a powerful impact that I've stayed with that backyard model as a way of saying, what we're going to do is incredibly intimate. It's familiar, but it requires each of you to do this more like your neighbors rather than your spouses. Wow. And so, you know, embrace embrace that the kind of courtesies you'd extend a neighbor that you're emotionally not even thinking about extending a spouse. And I've, I've used that metaphor ever since. <laughs> wow. Um, just boundaries, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Not- and boundaries. Absolute boundaries. Has anyone been hearing me? Have you guys been hearing this? Well, they can't answer you, Michael, but I think so. What it sounds like, it sounds almost like his ears must have been burning. <laughs> Bim Malama. <laughs> what is going on here? What? He's been banging on the door to get in. Wait. Oh, look at that. Look, crashing the party. Crashing the. <laughs> Was that you, Jim? Was that you <clears throat> with all that ruckus? Just, just testing your security. Wow. Uh, all right. <laughs> We've been zoom bombed. <laughs> Wait a second, uh, Chip. Chip, we, we need a few more minutes with Chip. But you're the uh, the Q and A is very active. I mean, there's you know, there's tough talk about David Geffen's home and uh, putters. Uh, what do you got? What dirt do you have uh, on Chip? You're going to share with the world. Don't 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 have uh, time for all that. Uh, the, I, I wanted to ex- extend one concept, which is the the empathy concept. Um, but I think you know, empathy is a part of developing rapport, you know, the, the yeah. effective working relationship. And it's it's not just empathy. It's also competence and experience and authenticity. Right. So just want to do that. And then the other thing is, you know, Chip is the perfect example of really uh, family mediation, particularly becoming sophisticated. And, you know, against this background of cooperation, collaboration, working together, optimization, maximization, we're coming out with killer settlement agreements that are just amazing. And over the course of time, the marketplace has spoken to the value of that. And my main point here is for, for mediation generally, it's the ability to facilitate an optimized set of arrangements that is our secret sauce. No, no other process is set up to do that. And we're set up to do it capably, comfortably, affordably, and now online, you know, at half the price when it comes down to it. So Chip, what your real place in the field, I think, was to confirm the sophistication with which we could develop solutions, big bucks cases, complex cases, you name it. And, uh, you know, I think your your value was huge in elevating the overall quality and sophistication of our work product. Wow. Jim, you had me at secret sauce. <laughs> the uh, Now, the other thing I was just saying in the Q&A is that despite owning the world's most expensive putter, uh, Chip's putting on the golf course has just gone downhill ever wow. since he got that butter. Oh, and whoa, uh, whoa. It's I also want to mention Chip used to be able to outdrive me. Wow. But I think I'm on, I will we'll so often go to the course, hit a couple of drives and they end up about three feet apart. Should I so cut that, him off, Chip? Should I just cut him off? Yeah. Come on. No, yeah. I, think he, I think he needs this uh, yeah. as, as some kind of validation. Yeah. Um, oh, there's but, the puppy. Uh, All right. All right. But we have different qualities, and we've always thought that we would we would do very well together in a in a team golf event because it, certainly uh, pre- previously I could significantly out drive him, but his fairway shots and putting were um, were something I was always aspiring to. Jim, stay on your own putting green, and and Chip will stay on his own putting green. Jim, thanks for the drop in. Always lovely to see you. Uh, wow, Chip, Chip Rose and Jim Malama, the, the dynamic duo together on Inside the Mediation Room. You won't see that every day. Bye, Jim. Uh, we have a few more minutes here with Chip. Thanks for joining. All right. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, wow. Uh, see? We have wow. That was great. Uh, Karen. All right. Final 10 questions. Wow. The final We're going to go at it quickly. We have the final three. Ten. These are the 10 
questions that James Lipton made famous on Inside the Actors Studio. Uh, they were originally asked by French talk show host Bernard P Pivot. And um, who begins, Karen, you or me? You go. Number one, Chip Rose, who we thank so dearly uh, for sharing everything you have today and for your absolutely unparalleled career. Question one. Thank you. What is your favorite word? Escarpment. Escarpment is a plateau in the West where the the earth has shifted and pushes up what looks like a cliff. And it's the, it's the place where you would, as a, a leading a wagon train across the desert, look up and see, you know, a uh, hundred uh, Indian braves on their horses that would just scare the crap out of you. <laughs> but the es escarpment is just the word, I love the way it sounds, uh, you know, and you see them everywhere you go. All right. The other, I... word, the other, word, that's, the other word that's right close with that is cops. C-O-P-S-E, a copse of trees. It just sounds so lovely. It's a, it's, a, it's a group of trees that are sort of by themselves called a copse of trees. We it's love the way that sounds. More often, we need to hang around Chip, Michael, our, our vocabulary. We <laughs> definitely- say, He said sophistication. <laughs> You've just gotten a little more sophisticated here. Yeah. Definitely here. What's the next question? What is your least favorite word? The word you, and I tell clients this all the time because almost anything that follows it is dangerous. Ooh. Because it, it has your focus on the other person instead of your acknowledgement that you're speaking for yourself. So uh, well, all you care about is, or all he wants to do is, it's, it's, it's uh, it, when I tell clients, I wanna hear you use the word I because almost anything that follows the word you is gonna be bad or it's gonna push the other person away. So just speak for yourself and that'll be, that's all we need is for each of you to speak for yourself. Well, and well, the, other, the other second most dangerous word is we, because it presumes you have the right to speak for the other person. Now in normal marriage and lives, you know, you, everybody's comfortable enough that, that only every once in a while that you get your spouse kind of going, oh my God, when the other spouse says, well, we like, or we something. But when you're in, when the relationship is fracturing, it's, it's a dangerous word. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Okay. Unless we say we like you, Chip, because you are the best. If we're not saying that, <laughs> probably need to not. Awesome. Very kind of you. All right. All right. With two minutes to go in just a word or two, question number three on the questionnaire. What turns you on? Two-year-olds hugging. So sweet. What turns you off? Forty-year-olds expressing disdain from their for their partner. Mm -hmm. What sound or noise do you love? Uh, uh, manufactured sound of violin concerto. A natural sound, rain. Mm. What sound or noise do you hate? Um, leaf blowers and crying children. Because mm. okay. it means they need to be they need to be attended to. Okay, so don't come over anytime soon. Oh no, no, no! I mean, I, you know, it, it just it just <laughs> it just means. Sometimes you need to let them cry because it's actually a healthy physical development. So it isn't like it's always bad, but when they're crying because of a need or pain, um, I just hate hearing that. You know? Yeah. Number seven, what is your favorite curse word? You know, I struggled uh, with that idea. Um, because it, it uh, uh, you know, I'll just grab something when I'm anxious or frustrated, not anxious, but frustrated, mostly when I'm frustrated. And, and then I always regret that it's such an ugly sound, whatever, whatever particular word uh, strikes me. So um, um, I don't find any pleasure in articulating that. Good answer. Good answer. And Chip, 
what profession other than your own, which you're so amazing at, I can't imagine you doing anything else, but if you could, what would you like to attempt? I've fantasized about being Dear Abby and mm-hmm. having a, a syndicated, uh, you know, you get a million letters, you pick a few, you write answers that are more often than not, you know, fairly obvious answers and you get rich. Well, that would be fun. Number nine, what profession would you not like to do? Um, I, I am repelled from the thought of being a dentist. Mm. First of all, you're, you, you work with your head bent over so that by the time you're at the uh, you know, second half of your career, you have neck issues. And I just don't want to spend my time looking in people's mouths. And finally, Karen. Help me out here. I know it's a pearly gates one. If what? heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? It's, I don't know that it's what I'd like to say, but I expect him to say, rose, 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 rose. I've got a rose, but no, no rose. Wow. wow. There it is. Um, rose. Wow. Rose, you will be there, Rose. Um, Wow. Unbelievable to have you on the show. Chip Rose, thank you so, so much. Karen. Thank you, Chip. Karen, thank you. And thank Michael. This this has been so much fun. Um, I I could not have enjoyed it more. And uh, as I do, your friendship. The feel thanks you, Chip. We thank you. This has been... Another episode of Inside the Mediation Room. Michael and Karen are at Chief Rose with us today. Yeah, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks, Mediate.com. Mediate.com, we love you. Woo! Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us.